Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Should a pastor preach against the sins of his congregation? Of course. And of course not. The sermon is that part of the service where God's Word exposes our failures and proclaims Christ's provision. The end is not the sin, but neither can the sin be ignored. The pastor does not preach simply to tell the congregation, stop it, try harder, this is the right way to go. Rather, he preaches to tell the congregation, stop trying harder, Jesus already went this way. That is, he wants us to face our sins, give thanks for the forgiveness of our sins, and in gratitude seek to follow the royal law of love. As such, pastors do indeed preach sin. The notion that a pastor should hide the sins of the flock from the flock so as not to offend, to keep them from leaving the church, is pure folly. No church has enough musical skill, no pastor enough entertaining style, no coffee shop enough tasty coffee to keep the crowds coming. What the church has are the words of eternal life, which begin with repent and end with and believe the gospel. Even in less seeker-friendly services, though, we can find the same problem. Here, the pastor is willing to preach against sin, but against the sins of those who are absent. He may fuss about the bad theology or the bad strategy of the church down the street, or he may thunder against the sins of the world. But it is the sheep of his fold that need to know and repent for their sins. He, that is the pastor, he is not called to prophesy against Nineveh while safe in the streets of Jerusalem. In what sense, then, is it wrong to preach against the sins of the congregation? Well, the pastor is not called when he steps into the pulpit to deliver a sermon inspired by Mr. Jones' inability to make it to church on time or Mrs. Brown's propensity to spread gossip. Now, it may well be that someone does need to talk to Mr. Jones or Mrs. Brown, but the sermon is not the time for that. A pastor ought not to take up the time he has been given to open up the text of God's Word in order to do private discipleship in public. He does not abuse his opportunity to put someone in his place. So how do we avoid both of these failures? Well, the preacher should preach to his own sins. It is likely that doing so will mean that he's also preaching against the sins of his own congregation. While we all sin spectacularly, we likewise mostly sin the same. The sins of the congregation likely don't exclude the preacher. When the preacher preaches against his own sins, he can address where we go wrong, where we are in need of grace and repentance, rather than a situation where he preaches against where you go wrong. Preaching, friends, ought to convict. Otherwise, it's just 
wasted time. It ought, however, to also clearly provide the solution to our guilt in extolling the provision made to us by Christ in his death for us. May all preachers decrease, and the one they preach, may he increase. One of our deepest weaknesses as Bible-believing Christians is that we don't much believe the Bible. And we agree in a sub, or not subjective, we agree in a, an overarching sense. We say, yes, the Bible is true. But when we think about it, I'm afraid that we have a propensity to think about its history as somehow uh, too fantastic, too unusual, too different from our own uh, to actually be accurate, especially the farther back we go. Well, today in our ongoing series, In the Beginning, uh, we come back to Genesis chapter 2, where we had looked uh, last time at the grace of God and the condescension of God in coming and, and, and making Adam from the dust of the earth. And what I want you to not miss is this. When God comes down and takes the dust of the earth and fashions man and breathes life into him, do you know what that means? That means there was a guy... His name was Adam. He was a real guy. And he came to life. He, he was made out of the dust of the ground by God himself. God breathed into him. He became a living man. And then, as our text moves on, he's placed in the Garden of Eden. A real place. I confess that one of those, you know, you, you often wonder, well, what are you going to ask about when you get to heaven? Well, one of the first things I want to know is, where was the Garden of Eden? I'm, I'm not so concerned that there might be an answer I might not like or an answer I'll like better than another. Rather, the idea is, I, I, I love the idea that it's really a place. It's not what it once was, but it's really a place. It's a real garden with a real man. And verse 9 says, And out of the garden the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, one of the reasons why uh, people are less prone to believe that the creation account is historical is because of this kind of language. They say, well, look, this is... This doesn't sound like history. This sounds like poetry. I mean, what in the world is a tree of life? What in the world is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That, that's uh, got to be some sort of symbolism, some sort of uh, type or something like that. And so this is much more poetic than it is historical. And to that, I say, no, <laughs> it's just not. It is historical. There was a tree of life. There was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were real trees. And I, I would suspect that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil may have been a very ordinary tree. It may have been given that name because it was used by God as uh, this test uh, on Adam and Eve. One of the reasons why I suspect, again, that this is not intended to be communicated by poetry is what comes next. Verse 10, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havla. And I'll stop there. Because the point is, these are, this is a map. This is directions. Now, again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the world is exactly the same, that we could follow this and actually find where Eden was. These, some of these places have probably moved. Uh, probably the, the, uh, flood that covered the whole earth had a great impact on this. But at the time, this was a place. You don't make up a story or make up a poem and say, uh, name four different rivers that are actual rivers that were there. This is true. This is real. Adam is in this garden that is uh, the source of these four rivers. It's filled with trees, and God gives him instructions. Don't eat of the free of the knowledge of good and evil, but every other tree you're welcome to eat from. 
I want you to tend and I want you to keep my garden. But if you eat of that fruit I told you not to eat, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Amazing. Astonishing. It really happened. Now, I, I, in this context, I have to be really careful not to say, well, you know, Adam was a person just like you and me. Adam was a person, but he wasn't just like you and me. Adam is a person who is without any sin. Imagine this not nature of the existence of Adam. You are free of sin. You are free of sickness. You are free of disease. You're free of hardship. And you get to walk with God in the cool of the evening. It is paradise. And friends, one of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to slow down and to enter into and to feel viscerally that reality, what that, that this was real, that this is paradise, is because it tells us so much about where we're going. The new heavens and the new earth is all of reality gardenized to match the Garden of Eden. No pain, no hardship, no difficulty, no sin, and walking with God. This is where we're going in addition to being where we came from. Now, next time, we're going to look together at uh, a unbelievably glorious moment uh, in the very early history of man, uh, when man became man and woman. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.